Hey folks, it's Rob, and welcome back. Uh, we're still with the player's manual from the Red Box basic set from 1983. And uh, we've played both solo adventures, and we had a little look around last time, uh, where I just kind of strolled through some of the middle and uh, around the book, basically. And, uh, you know, did a little rambling and uh, wasn't as productive as it could have been, I guess. Uh, thank you for your forbearance. Um, this episode, I'm hoping to focus on character generation, which uh, starts on page 48. Okay. Um, we have some dice to hand. Um, I mean, these are the ones I've been using all along, right? Uh, these two sets, which uh, these metallics don't show up too well on the camera unless I get them high up. They, they, they don't read too well down here. So I haven't been, you haven't been seeing too much of them. They, they come from this box, which is the box I'm holding, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, you're going to need some D6s for uh, rolling up characters. And so I have a, here a basic Chessex uh, set of six ciders, right? And... Uh, I was going to use these, but I can't locate the sixers that match in with these. I did I get an extra set of sixers that match in with these for purposes of use, and uh, they're not to hand right now. Maybe I'll be able to turn them up, but I thought these have nice high contrast and would read very well under the camera, and yeah, I think they do, but uh, you know, if I'm going to roll 3d6, I don't want to roll them one at a time. And these will read just fine, right? So, who knows? If we do more with dice. Maybe we'll find. Maybe I'll find the other sixers. Maybe I won't. Maybe I won't need them. But let's get into reading the rules for par character generation. And uh, you know, you're gonna want, in addition to some dice, you're gonna want something to write down on. You're not gonna necessarily want to put everything on the character sheet directly. I recommend writing it out on something you can just kind of scribble onto and then transferring all the set details onto the character sheet because you know, there's uh, there's options for like moving some points around potentially with first off with your statistics and maybe there are choices you want to make or something like that maybe you know I, I find um, making the formal character sheet second is my best approach now that doesn't have to be yours and again i'm working with a pen right uh if you were working with a nice mechanical pencil or even just a regular h2 you know uh, uh, you know uh type 2 pencil uh soft lead whatnot <laughs> you know got an eraser um uh, go ahead go ahead and erase and write all all you like i like a nice clean character sheet when i start um <clears throat> but that's me right I, actually, thinking about it, <clears throat> I think I might have some of the stuff over here that I use for, I've used for play. Yeah, see, like, this is what I wrote up for uh, an early encounter called the Old Mill, right? And at the bottom here, I have a character called G uh, William Gill Guinness, right? And he's the person who basically is going to be the town mage a level three magic user and uh just has like stats here and some you know like uh hp and ac block and level and the the stuff they have and i, I know this is more than a few magic items but they but they're a wealthy person who came back from the capital to be out here in the boondocks and the, in a way i've set them up to not be a combat person but as an invitation information and assistance person right but we need to clean out the mill, and so I did a little map, and you know, set some monsters, giant rats, and sturges, and da 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 da, da right? <clears throat> and then, when for combat, like I had these post its, right? Where like the sturge is worth this many XP, its AC is seven, morale is seven, it's a half hit die. Uh, damage one hit point on hit, and then once attached, it does a D3 per round, right? And it's plus two to hit for surprise, aerial attack, no bonuses afterwards. Meanwhile, giant rat, 
You see a giant rat. We killed gi three giant rats in the solo adventure. They're AC seven. They have a morale eight. They're half hit die, and their bite does a D three, right? And they're five XP each. And she completed this last year, which was nice. Um, or like, uh, yeah, rescued prisoner. And see how like I've done a lot of my play notes on here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know <clears throat> that's stuff from my own campaign play that i cooked up myself but uh like i said my character sheets i like to have them cleaned up and presentable at least before we start playing all right let's get into reading <clears throat> so page 48 Making up a new character. After you're used to the rules of the game by playing your fighter, you can try other characters by using the character sheets in included in this booklet. But remember that they are not usable in the solo adventure. That adventure was designed only for your first fighter. Sooner or later, you will want to make up your own new character. Before you start, get a pencil and all the dice. You also need a blank character sheet or a normal sized piece of paper to keep track of the details. So by normal size, we mean like an eight by 10 or uh, an A3, right? No, not A3, A4, sorry. It's been a moment since I lived in Britain. <clears throat> A4. <laughs> uh, those aren't exactly the same eight by 10, uh, uh, eight and a half by 11, uh, eight by 10, basically. You know, they're, they're roughly the same size. Um, <clears throat> Uh, if you're using a blank piece of paper, copy the form of the character sheet onto it. In other words, allow a space for your name and the character's name at the top left and the place for class, level, armor class, and hit points below that and so forth. Your first try at creating a new character will probably take an hour or so. Even when you are used to the new procedure, it will still take 10 to 30 minutes. You should not try to create a character after everyone gets together for the game. After the rolling, adjusting, buying, and so forth, should be all the rolling adjusting and buying and so forth should be done beforehand and that is true unless you're holding one of these newfangled session zero sessions you really should have a character made before you are uh joining the game for, for play right now if you don't have a character and you've told the dm in advance maybe the dm will have a character for you right but if uh, you're expected to come with a character please come with a character it's only you know it's only courteous to your fellow players to be prepared so, <clears throat> your dungeon master will be needed for part of the process and should watch the creation of the character, including all dice rolls. You should get together with the DM before the game to work out the details. One good method is to have all the players make new characters together with the dungeon master helping. So that is basically like the session zero. Um, and we used to make characters independently. We didn't have to watch each other. Uh, we just assured everybody was at least cheating to the same level if they were cheating. <laughs> uh, and we tried to set rules that didn't require cheating. Our general preferred method of rolling dice for character generation was 46 and drop the lowest. So you'd take 46. And, well, that one's cocked, even though it's a six. All right, see, uh, we got a one, so we drop that, and we have a six, right? And that's generally how we would count for their stats, because we figured, eh, we have so much heroic characters. We aren't just general nobodies. So let's let the dice at least encourage that, right? And that's what we used to do. Uh, let's see here. So, at the bottom of this page is a list of the steps to take when making a nude character. Each step is then explained in detail. Now, it's not at the bottom of this page. It's over here. <laughs> Again, this is the early half of the 80s. And they don't have, like, the word processing, all electronic formatting that we do now. There was some early word. Uh, my understanding is that they did have some early computer technology over at TSR in Geneva. But, uh, yeah, I mean, 
we've already seen a few items that didn't get caught in the edit. And again, this is fairly early, but I don't think this moves at all in any edition. <laughs> um, that's partly why they came up with the compendium is because like you have these five box sets with rules all along and some things that came from the gazetteers and uh, they just went, you know what, this, this could be just one consistent and throughout rule set instead of just being like, okay, I'm going to move to level four, so I need to get the other box set out now, right? So, one, roll for ability scores. Instead of just making up numbers for your ability scores, you will roll dice to find each score. This is done by rolling the six-sided die three times and adding the results. Or if you have other six-sided dice, roll three dice together. For example, if you roll one each time, then the total score is three, the least po possible. If you roll all sixes, then the total is 18, the highest you can have. You should finish with six numbers, each between three and 18, which are your character ability scores. Write the scores down as you roll them next to the names of the abilities. So that is kind of how you get to straight 3d6 right there. Uh, which I have to say is not even in the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. It can be brutal rolling 3d6 straight down, but you know, we're going to follow the rules today. So, uh, so, now find all your highest ability, find your highest ability score. If it is less than 9, you should roll all the scores again. You may keep the character if you wish, but he or she is probably won't be suitable for dangerous adventuring. However, before you discard the character, ask your dungeon master what to do. Your DM might prefer that you play the character you rolled, especially if you are an experienced player. If two or more ability scores are less than six, the character may have problems later on. This type of character should also be discarded unless the DM says otherwise. You can adjust the ability scores in step three, exchange ability points, but first you must decide what class your character will be. So. We're going to follow these rules, and we're going to assume we can discard the low scores. So let's get 3d6 out. And get myself a little piece of scratch paper here just to start, right? Forgive the uh, envelope. <laughs> um, but we're going to need to eventually turn these into actual stats on the character sheet. And I'm not even going to use, still use a character sheet, but I am going to write over here on my graph paper, which we were using for the mapping, uh, strength, right, intelligence, charisma, dexterity, constitution, and wait, did I put charisma? Already? I should have put wisdom up here, sorry. Wisdom, that's the usual format. Charisma goes last. There we go. Strength, Intelligence, Wisdom, Dexterity, Constitution, Charisma. Right? Right. So, let's roll some dice. So, for our first roll, and actually I should, well, we're going to take it, but it's, I should be rolling in the, in the box. 7 plus 6 is 13. So, that's a 13. Ooh, that's a nice 15. So, you know, so far, probably not discarding this character. That's seven, eight. Another optional household is to like re roll your lowest score, <laughs> which would sometimes happen. That's 14. Let's see, 4, 10, 12. One more score attribute to roll for. Uh, 13. Okay. So we got 13, 15, 8, 14, 12, and 13. It's not great. It's not bad. Honestly, this is pretty dealable for basic Dungeons and Dragons. Not everybody's going to be a superhero, but there are there's a point by system, so uh, we'll be coming to that soon enough. But uh, 
what we have here, choose a class. Each type of character is called a class. Your first character class was a fighter. You know now that there are other kinds of adventurers, clerics, magic users, and thieves. You could play one of those, or even as a character that's not human, you could be a dwarf, an elf, or a short child-sized person called a halfling. Each of these seven adventure types is called is a character class. Each class has a specialty. Fighters are strong, magic users are intelligent, clerics are wise, and so forth. This specialty is called the prime requisite for the class. For example, strength is the prime requisite for fighters. If your character's prime requisite is high enough, you will get a bonus on experience points. That is why your first character got a bonus. Your strength, the prime requisite, was 17. You are allowed to play a fighter with any strength score, but strong fighters are better at what they do and get more XP than weaker ones. You're not forced to pick a class on your highest ability score, but it helps. If you have two or more high scores, you may wish to consider a non-human character. Look for the following chart and compare your highest ability scores with the prime requisites for the character classes. Then, if you are playing human character, pick one class that fits the ability scores you rolled. Constitution and Charisma affect all the classes and are never primary requisites. So, Strength for Fighters, Intelligence for Magic Users, Wisdom for Clerics, Dexterity for Thieves. Um, right there. Dwarves, Elves, and Halflings. Any human character can be, be any of the four human classes, but non-human characters are handled differently. If you wish to play a non-human character, you must have high enough ability scores in certain areas. Elves have abilities similar to both fighters and magic users, so must have good scores in both strength and intelligence. Both of these ability scores are prime requisites for elves. Also, if your character has an 8 or less for intelligence, the character cannot be an elf. So there are just no dumbass elves, elves out there. I mean, to be a dumbass elf is still a pretty average human. <laughs> Halflings have some fighting abilities and must be, have good strength and dexterity. Both of these are prime requisites for halflings. In addition, halflings are also very healthy. If your character has an 8 or less in dexterity or constitution, character cannot be a halfling. Dwarves are also healthy too. If your character has an 8 or less in constitution, the character cannot be a dwarf. Dwarves specialize in combat, similar to fighters, so their prime requisite is strength. And we have a little chart down here. Uh, if you wish to play a non-human character, you may, may pick one of these if you have rolled the minimum scores given, or if you can exchange ability points, see step three to meet the new minimum scores for the class. Whichever class you pick, you should read the full description of the class on pages 23 to 47 before you get to step six. So, Let's talk about this down here. So, your minimum scores are 9 in Constitution for a Dwarf. Elves need minimum Intelligence 9. Halflings need Constitution 9 and Dexterity 9. Right? But the prime requisites are Strength on Dwarves. Elves are Strength and Intelligence. And Halflings are Strength and Dexterity. Right? So, let's get into the later point here, and that is prime requisites. If you rolled well and chose well, the ability score of your prime requisite should be 9 or greater. But it can be fun to play characters with low scores too. Imagine a poor dwarf who is perfectly healthy, constitution 16, but very weak, strength 5. He does the best he can in combat, but doesn't do much damage. And that's true, he'd have a damage and strike penalty. <sighs> the fun in the game comes from role-playing, and this could be a very interesting character to play. Remember that you can always start another character later. For a very high prime requisite score, your character gets a bonus to XP, experience points. At the end of each adventure, when the dungeon master gives XP, you will add extra points. But if your prime requisite is low, you will be penalized and you must subtract XP from the number awarded by the DM. The amount of XP added or subtracted is given in the following chart. And I believe that chart is not even on this page. 
even though the example is. Yeah, I can't say it's a chart. <laughs> uh, examples. If your magic user has an intelligence of 14, you get an extra 5 XP for every 100 XP awarded by the DM. If your fighter has a strength of 5, you only get 80 XP for every 100 XP awarded because it's a minus 20% penalty. So exchanging ability score points. So this is where the point buy system comes in, and this is how we're going to try to modify this to make this into whatever the heck we want. Although if this is strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, and charisma, we're leaning heavily towards either an elf or a magic user. Uh, but it wouldn't be a bad thief, right? Just from raw points. And, you know, if this is constitution of 14, yeah, we could do a dwarf or a halfling. You know, it, 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 you know we're, our options are pretty wide open, actually. I just wouldn't want it to be a cleric with a, with a wisdom of eight, right? And since the points aren't exchanged one for one, you definitely want to just nudge something if you're going to make an adjustment because you don't want to blow away scores that are otherwise okay, right? These 13s are actually already a modifier. The 12 isn't. Uh, the 8 is it's a negative modifier uh, so you know let's have a read at this point it is possible to raise prime requisite by lowering other ability scores this is like practicing hard hard to learn your class but it the cost of not developing another ability at the same time for example a magic user might study hard and neglect his exercise for higher intelligence and end up with a lower strength the rules for exchanging ability points are, one, your prime requisite, and only that score, goes up by one point for each two points that another ability score goes down. Two, constitution and charisma points can never be exchanged with others. So those are not dump stats here. You can't go ahead and just flush those out for points for increasing another score. Dexterity cannot be lowered, but it may be raised if you have a thief or a halfling character. So again, dexterity is what it is. No score can be lowered below 9. If it is already 10 or less, it cannot be lowered. So, example. An elf has an intelligence and strength scores of 12 and a wisdom of 13. The player drops the wisdom score to 11, so it can be added. So it, it says, so 1 can be added to strength and then drops the wisdom again to 9 and adds one to intelligence. This results in intelligence and strength scores of 13, good enough for a 5% XP bonus, and an adjusted wisdom of nine. A cleric with strength and wisdom of 15 drops the strength by six to nine and raises wisdom by three to 18. Now this is another example, even though it's not in the grayed out example box. If you want to exchange any ability score points, you must do that now before going any further by making a character no exchanges can be made later. So, we need to decide a class, because that dictates what we can modify. But again, we can only modify certain things in certain ways. So, these two, here, I'll write it out. So, strength, intelligence, right, wisdom, dexterity, con, constitution, and charisma, right? So we can't modify these at all. Those are what they are. They're not bad. In fact, the slight charisma bonus is kind of nice, actually, uh, in proper role playing, because those adju uh, uh, attitude adjustments are nice. And followers are a thing. Dexterity is always nice. It's always nice to not be hit by the enemy. And having a 14, it... It's a, it's a one adjustment, right? Um, wisdom, wisdom is weak, but it's not bad. It, it's, it's a, you're not wise. <laughs> you're a little foolhardy, but you're not a moron. You know, you're not staring up at the sun going, why? Well, uh, uh. <laughs> and um, intelligence is quite high on this character, as is, and the strength is good. This could easily be an elf, and that's, not a 
bad idea. But if we go with Elf, we really don't have any points to move. Because the Wisdom is already 8, and we can't move any of these. And so it would just be moving points between these two. And if I'm taking from two points from here to add one point to Strength, that's not terribly helpful. Uh, taking two from Strength to add one to Intelligence is a difference in XP bonus, kind of. If Like, if I was to be a mage, a magic user, taking the two points off of here would help by increasing the Intelligence to 16th, which has long-term effects on your character, honestly, as to, um, you know, your XP bonus. Because that 16... I believe is actually good for you to have a 10% XP bonus. And a 10% XP bonus is well worth having. Um, but let's make an elf. Yeah, we got fairly good scores. We'll make an elf. And we'll leave these as is. So, uh, yeah. Let's throw an elf. All right. <clears throat> So, roll for hit points. And again, this is where in our house rule often comes in. A lot of people play with maximum hit points for first level. Uh, nothing wrong with that. No judgment. Done it myself. Uh, but the rules as written, we got to roll for roll a die for hit points. So, different classes have different number of hit points. Fighters and dwarves need many because they take damage in battle. Magic users and thieves have less hit points and should try to stay out of fights. Other character classes are in between and can fight if they must, but often avoid, if po avoid it if possible. Find your character's class on the chart below and roll one die to find out their starting hit points. So, an elf gets a d6. Uh, fighter's d8. Dwarf's d8. Cleric is d6. A uh, halfling is a d6, magic user is a d4, and a thief is a d4. And obviously that dictates how many your maximum possible hit points are. We need to roll a six-sided dice for an elf hit points. Hey, six is great. So, I rolled a six. We do get adjustment for constitution. <laughs> Now find your constitution score on the bonuses and penalties for ability scores table below and apply the bonus or penalty to the number of hit points you rolled. But whatever the adjustments, your hit points cannot be lowered to zero. You will have at least one hit point for each roll. And that's true. So going back to here, our constitution is 12, which means we just miss out on an adjustment, right? Had it been 13, we would have gotten plus one. And if we were playing with the house determination that we can assign these out, I'd probably move Charisma over to Constitution and get that one hit point. Because that one hit point is every level up to like level nine. Nine more hit points in the end isn't huge, but it is huge beginning on. And trust me, I'm very fortunate I got a six for the hit points. Because there are plenty of characters out there with like one or two hit points. And really, you're just like, okay, I can't wait till I get to re-roll re -roll a new character. <laughs> but you're not really. Honestly, um, my most recent character was a, uh, that I was playing for a pickup game was a 7th level mage who had all of 15 hit points. And I didn't get hurt. I didn't get touched once. And it wasn't because of any kind of special magic items preventing me from getting injured. I played smart, let the tanky characters draw the attention of the monsters, and uh, basically, like, tried to rescue other people. <laughs> um, but enough about that. So, this chart is used for adjustments for most of the ability scores, and you will refer to it later. So, again, this is true, like, you know, the 13 and up is an adjustment for most stats in this game. And four of our stats are positive adjustments, right? And we have one negative adjustment. So on the whole, like I said, this is not a bad set of stats. 
You could immediately see the benefit of having a good constitution score. Your first character, the fighter with the constitution of 16, had a plus two bonus to the hit, po two hit points. Therefore, your starting roll for that character would have been a six out of eight possible, plus a bonus of two for a total of eight hit points. Did you ever get badly hurt down to two hit points in your adventures? Oh, yes, we did. <laughs> if so, you could have been dead, but you were saved by the bonus for your high constitution. Indeed. Each time you gain a level of experience, you will roll for more hit points, and each time you roll, you adjust the roll according to your constitution score. Roll for money. Your character starts out with no possessions except for normal clothes and a little money saved up over many years. You will need to go shopping for equipment, but first you must find out how much money you have. Roll 3d6, the total of three rolls on a six-sided die, and multiply the total by 10. For example, if you roll a 12, the total is 120. This is the amount of gold pieces that you start with. Write that on the back of your character sheet in the money box. So, it doesn't matter what class you are in this edition, you get same 3d6 for cash, right? Now, maybe you'll have your DM will specify different setting backgrounds or something like that, and maybe they'll tell you you have certain forms of common equipment and you don't even need to go shopping for them. But this game wants you to go and specify how much money you have and go shopping, right? So that's six, eight, nine, ninety gold pieces, which could be worse. Armor is the biggest expense, honestly, for a fighting character. We're gonna just put ninety GP right here, right now, because we're gonna definitely be spending some money. Although it is a half hour, so I'm going to stop here at step six where we're going to be buying equipment and we'll join this next time. Uh, thank you all for watching. I hope you're interested in what we're doing. And, you know, I, if you've made it this far, you certainly probably are. Or you're just supporting my channel and me, and that's great. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart. Um, anyhow, we'll be back <laughs> in the next episode. You have a great day. Bye now.